Okay, so now that it's 5.30, I'm gonna repeat what I just finished telling uh, Sarah. Uh, so what I've, I've decided to change what's happening on the test. Your first test, which will be uh, Wednesday during lab, Mr. Mitchell's gonna proctor it for me. Uh, so you're going to your lab like normal. He will meander around the lab to make sure you're not using internet searches or anything like that. You're allowed to have a scientific calculator. You're not allowed to use your phone to do that, by the way. You actually have to have a scientific calculator. You're not allowed to use an iPad or anything like that to do it uh, as your calculator either. You actually have to have a calculator. You need to have an equation sheet. You, you're not required to have one, but you're allowed to, so you should. The only equations that are allowed, at least from chapters one and two, are the ones that are uh, labeled and numbered in your textbook. Hmm. And uh, you will be allowed an hour and 15 minutes to take that test. If you've got an accommodation, then obviously we have to abide by that. So you'll have that amount of time, uh, but you're not allowed internet searches. You're not allowed books. You're not allowed notes in that one. And that just covers chapters one and two. But immediately upon finishing that test or sometime that day, test two will appear and that's going to be a completely online test that will cover chapters three and four so actually no it since i'm doing four yeah we should be able to cover enough of four tonight so it, it will be available uh wednesday night yes wednesday night it should be available thursday morning at the latest but you have until tuesday at 11 59 p.m to finish your three attempts and i only take your highest so take it as much as you want uh, the practice tests disappear as well at the same time. So, for instance, practice test one has been up for you on chapters one and two. Uh, Wednesday at the time of your lab, that, that practice test is going to disappear. So that's your last chance to take that. And the same thing will happen with the other one. Uh, 11.59 on Tuesday of next week, uh, practice test two will disappear. And then uh, you have until 11.59 that night as well to finish test two. Any questions on that? I so the first test will just be on chapters one and two, second on three and four. Go ahead, Nora. Okay. Oh, oh the first test you said is on th one and two, which is what we're taking Wednesday. Yes. And that's the one that I had to practice test out for already. Now I've got both of them out, but. Okay. So test two, it, we're just looking far in advance, is going to be the next week. So yeah. next Wednesday instead. Uh, well, it's, it's, you're allowed to take it any time between when it appears and Tuesday at, at 14, excuse me, at 11.59 p.m. It's, a, it's an online test. Oh, okay. All right. So then that means that we're allowed to use any resources for that except other people. And then for test one, we're just taking that in the lab and it's just going to cover chapters one and two. Yeah, it's a regular test. So you don't get all those extra bells and whistles like yeah. notes and textbook and Google and all that stuff. Right, got you. Okay, I thought it was going to be comprehensive from one to four, and I didn't know if that's what you had said or not. So yeah, every sure. chapter test, every time we have a test, is always going to be comprehensive. So sometimes, okay. what I've done, for instance, like if I noticed you missed some particular type of problem in chapter two, the chapter or the test two, which covers chapters three and four, might very well have a similar problem to that, specifically because that was a weakness that I, I saw that y'all need to work on. Got you. Okay, got you. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah, I've got one more question. So um, for the extra credit assignments that we've had up until this point, how are they going to uh -huh. apply to our grade? Uh, the way I decided to do extra credits this semester is uh, I think I told you on your syllabus, I would drop your one lowest homework grade and no conceptual homework grades. So each time you do an extra credit, I, or each time I create an extra credit, I take an extra drop uh, that I'll be dropping from your homework. So it basically gives you a chance to make up for any zeros you might have by missing a homework on time. Okay, and then if you were just to not grade on homework or something would help you do in this? Yeah, if you don't do an extra credit, it's not gonna harm you. Uh, I would definitely make sure you take okay. the practice test though, because remember, like I said, the average of your practice test will be divided by 20 and added to your final course grade. So if you had a, if you'd taken okay. every practice test and managed to score a hundred at least once, then you'd have a hundred practice test average at the end of the semester. And that would be five points added to your course grade. Okay, sounds good, thank you. No problem. Anybody else? 
Um, I have a question. Um, for the homework, do you have is the late policy still just like turn it in on time, or is there like a deduction for each day it's late? Yeah, there's uh, the my lab and mastering. It should tell you when you click on the assignment what the grading policy is. But if I remember correctly, it's uh, I think I take off a couple percent, maybe five percent for each day that it's late, up to some maximum. All right, just making sure. Thank you. No problem. All right, anyone else? All right, well, we essentially finished chapter three last time, uh, just like we're going to essentially finish chapter four uh, this time, but we, we, we didn't actually do relative motion, so I wanted to make sure I hit that. You'll notice I put a lot of uh, video links to my YouTube channel in last week's module, as well as in this week's module, and this week's module is on chapters four and five, so you'll see a lot of YouTube videos, and a lot of them are just me working examples. OK, some of them are lectures and they're usually long, but uh, some of them are examples. Uh, and I usually name them by one of the examples that it, that's in them. When you get there to the actual uh, my YouTube channel, you'll see they have a more full name. Like, you know, I'll name it uh, half of a Atwood machine when, in fact, it's got half of a Atwood machine and then it's got some other problems at the end. Uh, feel free to watch those in little bites, like solve a problem read it, then see, or watch me solve a problem, then try to solve the problem yourself. So you pause the video and uh, see if you can do it on your own without watching it. Maybe you take a break from it from there on out, or maybe you never go back to that video. That's okay. But the more that you do, the better off you'll be. So that's why I'm providing all those. None of them are in any sense required, but the more examples you see and the more examples you work, the better off you'll be on your tests. Okay. So uh, in, in finishing up the material from uh, chapter three, I wanted to go at, into relative velocity and I'm going to solve a problem not unlike your chapter three homework, which, you know, you had chapter three homework part one was due yesterday at 11.59 p.m., but part two is due uh, Tuesday at 11.59 p.m., so make sure you get that one done. But I wanted to give you the neat little way I use to solve uh, problems. So I want to share my screen. I'm going to share my uh, iPad. And it's going to tell me to do something. And whoop, that's not what I want to do. There it is. Okay. So what I, what I tell my students is when you're trying to solve a relative velocity problem, uh, you can consistently use this form. This is a vector and it's true whether you're doing one dimensional motion, which by a vector, we mean a positive is, is pointing in one direction a negative pointing in the other. But we can say the velocity of A as seen by C is equal to, and I, I need to read this for you. This is the velocity of object A as seen by C. So that's what that means there, that velocity of it. Uh, v sub AC means the velocity of A is seen by C. So A could be a spaceship and C could be in the Earth. So if you draw a picture of the Earth, you draw a picture of the spaceship and you say, you know, to the right is the X direction and up is the Y direction. And then everybody's got to agree anything going to the right is going to be a positive X direction. Anything going upwards, a positive Y direction. Now, you can actually use the relative velocity equation like this, what has to be true is that the first subscript has to match the first subscript on the left. The second subscript only has to match the first uh, subscript of the second one. So I'll put a blank there. And then this last subscript has to match the last subscript on the left. So you see that the A on the left-hand side of the equation is the first subscript. And you see that the first subscript on the right-hand side of the equation is A as well. Similarly, the last subscript you see on the left-hand side of the equation is C. 
And that's the last subscript you see on the right-hand side of the equation. Now, all the only other thing that matters is these two match. Okay. So for instance, I could write B here, and then that would just require that this be B. Now with this comes an additional rule. I'll put my vector symbols on top of it. The additional rule is that Vij is equal to the negative of Vji. So sometimes it'll come up that you might have VAB, but you don't have VBC. Maybe you'll have VCB. Well, that's okay. VCB is just equal to the negative of VBC, and uh, that'll work out, okay? So first off, I'm gonna show you an example with that, and I'm actually gonna tell you that relativistically, uh, this equation is almost right, except that you'd have VAC is equal to VAB plus VBC over one plus VAB VBC over C squared. So if we're talking about special relativity, which we are going to talk about later, so I'm going to give you a little peep at it now. Uh, you have to modify the Galilean relativity formula that I wrote up above uh, by including this denominator. Okay, notice this is just a separate rule here, so I'm just boxing it off. Okay, so let's imagine a scenario. Let's say this is Earth. And let's say we have a rocket ship, A, and it's traveling to the right, which I want to call the positive x direction. And I'm going to say VAE is equal to 0 0.800 times C, where C is the speed of light. And I'm also going to say there's a spaceship B over here. And it's moving with a velocity of B, as seen by the Earth, is equal to negative 0 0.900 times the speed of light. Okay. The speed of light, by the way, is, I think I'm remembering these digits correctly, but check in the front of your cover of your book. I think, I, I know the first three is 299. Whoa. I think the next three is seven, nine, two. And then the last three is four, five, eight meters per second, which is approximately equal to 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. That is basically 300 million meters per second or 186,000 miles every second. It's fast enough to go around the equator more than eight times in a single second. Uh, it can almost, well, it can get to the moon in about 1.2 seconds, or the moon can send, reflect light back to us in about 1.2 seconds. So that's how fast it is. So according to Galilean relativity, I would like to know what is the velocity of B as measured by A? Okay, so that's the big question. We know our formula, VBA is equal to VB. Well, I'll look up and I have a VBE, so I might as well put an E there. And then I'm going to say plus VE, and then the last has got to be A. So that's what I mean. I just had to make the first and last equal the first and last, and the middle two have to meet, meet each, uh, match each other. Now, in terms of vectors, this is all one-dimensional motion, so it's super easy. Uh, the vectorness of it is handled by it being either positive or negative. So I'm going to say the velocity of B with respect to A is equal to the velocity of B with respect to E minus the velocity of A with respect to E. See how I just used that rule that's up in the top right? I didn't have the velocity of the Earth is seen by A. But you could probably guess, according to the ship, 
it sees the Earth passing by it to its left, going to the left, which is the backwards direction for the ship. Uh, the Earth is passing by from front to back, so that's a negative direction at point eight C, and that should be right. And in fact, what you get now is negative zero point nine zero zero C minus zero point eight zero zero C. So you get an answer of negative 1.70 C. That's the Galilean result. Okay. Now B, let's say relativistic. So the only difference here is I'm going to say BBA is equal to VBE minus VAE over one minus VBE times VAE over C squared. So VBE is negative 0 0.900C minus 0 0.800C. All of this will be divided by one minus. And now what I'm going to have, notice if I write the VBE as negative 0.9C and then the VAE is 0.8C, the Cs are going to cancel out with that C squared. So I'm just going to get negative 0 0.900 times 0 0.800. So I get negative 1.70 C over, now you can see this is one, and if you multiply 0 0.9 times 0 0.7, you get 0 0.72. So this would be 1.72. So in fact, the velocity of B as seen by A is negative. Uh, that's a 1.72 and that's a 1.70 in case my writing's too small there. Uh, actually, let me do, fix this. Uh, if you divide that, I think you'll get 0 0.922. Let me actually double check that because I'm remembering off the top of my head. Zero point nine eight eight. And it's negative, by the way. C. So what relativity says is the laws of physics are the same for all inertial observers. This is special relativity. And the speed of light is a constant independent of the motion of the source of the observer. And because of that, you end up getting this equation for the addition of velocities as opposed to the Galilean one. And you can see that uh, what would normally should have been negative 1.70 this time the speed of light, turns out to still be just under uh, the speed of light. You're closer to the speed of light than either one, but you're not nearly as much as you would have been according to Galilean relativity. So uh, that's kind of neat. Now, I can imagine a photon torpedo fired from the ship and I'd say the velocity of the proton, ooh, ooh, velocity of the proton as seen by B is equal to negative C. So for part C, I want to know what is the velocity of the proton as seen by A? Okay, so everybody see that I added the proton uh, torpedo, proton, uh, I, I said, said proton, I said photon earlier. Photon is what I meant. I don't know why I keep saying proton. But a photon is the particle of light. It travels at the speed of light, and that's the only speed it travels. It never slows down or speeds up. So what we're going to do is now calculate the speed at which the photon is barreling in towards ship A. Okay, I'm going to do that on the next page, but I'm still going to use our same uh, formula. So the velocity of the photon as seen by A is equal to the velocity of the photon 
uh, as seen by B, because I happen to know that one is one that exists. Plus, I'm going to say the velocity of B as seen by A. So see the middle subscripts match and the outer two subscripts match the left. So we've got it all right. Uh, I just need the velocity of ship A with respect to B or ship B with respect to A, which is what we saw for last time. And then I got to do, I'm just going to do relativistically here. So it's one plus VPB, VBA over C squared. Well, that turned out like crap. Okay. So in this case, I know the velocity of the photon is seen by B is negative C. And the velocity of ship B as seen by A is negative 0.988 C. Now remember, everybody's got to agree what the right direction is. So to the right was positive. If something's going to the left and it's obviously negative, that's why we ended up getting negative 0.988 C. Okay, now I got to do one plus uh, negative one times, uh, excuse me, yeah, negative one times negative 0 0.988 C squared over C squared. And I think you can see immediately that is negative 1.988 C over 1.988 like that. And that, of course, gives you negative C, which is exactly the principle of relativity. The second principle of relativity is the speed of light is the, uh, independent of the motion of the source or the motion of the observer, it is in fact a constant. And it's that, you know, 3.00 times in the eight meters per second. And this equation showed that. That's kind of neat, right? I've got a question real quick. Yes. So I'm following you on the first, oh, sorry, can you go back? Okay. Um, the other slide. Yeah, so you have one plus negative one times negative 0.988 um, times C squared. So I know where the, the C squared in the bottom comes from, but why is there a C squared on the top and the bottom uh, for the fraction? Remember the velocity of the photon torpedo was negative one times C. Okay. Right there. And then of course the velocity that we got was uh, negative 0 0.988 C. Okay, thank you. So Thanks. both of them have a factor of C in it. And I just chose to write the C outside. There was a C here and under the, with the negative one, and there was a C with the negative 0 0.988. That's where they came from. Okay, thank okay. you. The good news is you're not needing to do this relativity yet. I just wanted to give you a little inkling of it, show you how that VIJ equals negative VJI could come in handy. But let's solve another problem. I had a question really quick before we move on. Go ahead. Um, so going back, just like theoretically, why, how do we explain the original VBA that we got and why it differs so much from the other VBA? Okay, so you're talking about uh, this version right here versus this version? Yeah, the relativistic one. Okay. Yeah. So it turns out if you notice real, uh, if you notice for a second that like the Hayabusa spacecraft was really, really fast. It went only orders of tens of thousands of meters in a second. Okay, that's super, super fast. But if you took 10,000 times 10,000 in the denominator of that second equation, you know, the VPA or VAB times VBC, that's going to give you 10 to the fourth times 10 to the fourth. That's about 10 to the eighth. <laughs> but the C squared is going to be 300 times 10 to the sixth, times 300 times 10 to the sixth. So that term, that VAB, VBC over C squared is so yeah. close to zero, it wouldn't affect the things that we see in everyday life. And in fact, you can explain VA, the, the top equation by realizing how small VAB, VBA, uh, VBC over C squared is. 
when we actually get to relativity, I will show you a way where you can derive that equation. And I'm, I'm actually will derive it for you, or you can look at my YouTube channel. It's there already. Uh, but the main thing is uh, the top one sort of makes sense. Let's think about it this way. Let's imagine you're on the back of a flatbed Mack truck. And let's, uh, let's go to stop sharing for a second. So imagine you're on the back of a, a flatbed Mack truck and you're walking, okay? And let's say you're walking at a rate of one mile per hour. And this is a really big flatbed Mack truck. The flatbed portion is literally a mile long. It's obviously driving on a really long straight road with no traffic, blah, 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 okay? But it's gonna be more than a mile long as a flatbed truck. And at T equals zero, you're gonna start walking at one meter per second backwards. And the truck is gonna go this way, okay? Now, if the truck was going 60 meters per second, which is really fast, because I wanted to use 60 miles per hour, but I chose to stick it in the SI system. So 60 meters per second is what the truck's going. Actually, I should have said, yeah, I'll do it like that. Let's say we're walking one mile per hour and the truck is going 60 miles per hour. OK, but the truck is going this way and you're walking this way. So at the end of one hour, the front edge of the Mac bed, uh, the Mac truck flatbed trailer has gone 60 miles because that's the definition of 60 miles per hour. Does that make sense to everyone? OK, now because of you walking one mile per hour back this way, you're now an hour have walked for an hour and are now therefore a whole mile away from the front of the Mac bed, a Mac truck uh, flatbed trailer. So you see that you've actually moved the distance of 59 miles in an hour. So what you found is the velocity of you with respect to the earth is equal to the velocity of the truck with respect to the earth plus the velocity of the earth with respect to you, which isn't that helpful because you don't know the velocity of the earth with respect to you, but you do know uh, the velocity of, of you with respect to uh, the truck, right? So what has happened is because you and the truck are both moving simultaneously, you sort of did the uh, a counteracting of the velocity of the truck. If you were going the same direction of the truck and you started at the back of the truck, then the, at the end of one hour, the back edge of the truck would have gone 60 miles, but you would have in fact gone a distance of 60 plus one miles. So the velocity of you with respect to the earth is equal to the velocity of you with respect to the truck plus the velocity of the truck with respect to you, or excuse me, with respect to the earth. So that's where that equation comes from originally. You can sort of just think of it as uh, uh, allowing something to travel for a whole hour really you don't really need it to go that whole hour it's just the hour is the easy thing to work with if you're dealing with miles per hour or kilometers per hour or something like that so does that make any sense does that maybe help it you makes, a little bit yeah it makes a little bit more sense i was just trying to get a general idea of why we use the second one more than we use the first one uh, okay so in reality we'll actually use the first one way more than the second oh one. okay okay yeah that's uh it's only when you're dealing, I mean, even the fastest things we have on earth uh, are not relativistic. Uh, in order for us, for instance, to measure some of the relativistic effects, we had to, uh, we have to actually take the Concorde jet, which was used to be the fastest jet that humans, that, that average people could use. Uh, and we flew it around the globe. In other words, we had to fly it that long and at the end of all that time, we had two cesium clocks that were linked up together, in other words, synchronized together, one of which rode the Concorde and the other which uh, stayed at home. And we calculated what relativity said would happen to the clock. And when we did that, we found that, in fact, what happened to the clock was exactly what relativity expected. So even when we try to do measurements to detect how things are different because of relativity, we have to use not only the fastest things on earth, but we have to use things that are measured out to like 12 decimal places before we can even see it happen. So yeah, we normally use that top starred equation, VAC uh, equals VAB plus VBC. We use that much more normally than we do the relativity one. 
when you get into the chapter of relativity, of course, we're going to use the relativistic one because we're dealing with things that are, the, the rule is basically if the rest energy of the particle is comparable to the kinetic energy of the particle, then you have to, you have to use relativity. If it's uh, way smaller than the rest energy, then you don't have to use uh, rel relativity. Another rule of thumb is about 1% of speed of light. You probably need, you know, three or four decimal places to, to catch it. So if you're not wanting accuracy to three or four decimal places, you probably don't need relativity unless it's bigger than a percent of the speed of light. All right, anybody else have any questions about that? And don't worry, we'll cover that more in relativity. I just, it's relativity and quantum mechanics are the two things that tend to excite students about physics as much as they can possibly be excited about physics, except for, you know, nerds like me who just love it, right? Uh, and we find mostly engineers aren't necessarily that excited with it. They, they might be remotely interested in it, but uh, they know they're not going to have to use it much. OK, if you're a double E or a computer uh, software engineer, you might have to use it a little bit. But even then, they're going to give you recipes and you just you just do what the recipe says. So. All right. So that's a nice uh, vector addition problem or what we call a, a excuse me, a relative velocity problem. So just remember that general formula VAC is equal to VAB plus VBC uh, and, and the outside uh, subscripts match the outside subscripts and the inside ma uh, subscripts match each other. Okay. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to imagine a stream that has a certain width and I'm going to imagine the stream has a velocity U. That's technically the velocity of the water with respect to the earth. Okay. So you can say that's the velocity of the water with respect to Earth if you really wanted to. Uh, we also have a boat that has a velocity v such that v is greater than u. Okay. Now this v is really uh, the velocity of the boat with respect to the water, just keeping that straight. Okay. Now, in part A, they want your boat to make a round trip upstream for a distance of d over 2 and then turn around and come back downstream the same distance. And they want to know t1 equals question mark. In other words, how long is that boat going to take? and going upstream a distance of d over two, and then back downstream a distance of d over two. And then they're gonna ask you to do the same thing perpendicular to the stream. You're gonna go up a distance of d over two, and then down a distance of d over two, and they wanna know t2 equals question mark. Okay. Well, we know the velocity v in general can be defined if it's a constant velocity it's going to be defined as distance divided by time so that tells us that time is equal to uh distance over velocity so that'll come in handy now what you'll see is that the velocity of the boat with respect to earth you might actually say, so we're doing part A now, which is this part, and this is part B, okay? Uh, what we might see is the velocity of the boat with respect to the Earth is equal to the velocity of the boat with respect to the water plus the velocity of the water with respect to Earth. So you can immediately see that uh, upstream, or let's say when I'm going downstream, let's erase that. And that's when I'm going with the current. That's what downstream means. Uh, VBE is equal to V plus U. And when I'm going upstream, VBE. Notice in that case, I'm actually fighting it 
So the velocity is V minus U. Does that make sense to everyone? Hopefully I'm still recording. It looks like I am. Okay. I kept hearing bleep bleeps because I kept hitting my keyboard. So T1 is going to be equal to T downstream plus T upstream. Does that make sense? So T is supposed to be distance divided by velocity. So my distance is D over two and my velocity upstream or yeah, excuse me, downstream is V plus U. And my distance downstream, actually, yeah, upstream now, uh, downstream now, no, I'm actually going upstream, sorry about that, uh, is still, and I've changed the letter to a lowercase d. Let me fix that real quick. Let's see if I can do this without raising everything else. Oh, that's not helpful at all. Oh, I highlighted it, no wonder. Okay, close enough. So that distance is capital D over two. Now upstream, we've got D over two over V minus U. Let's do that again. Now you might realize that we can get a common denominator and make this quite nice. All I have to do is multiply the left fraction by V minus U over V minus U, and I get D times V minus U. And then remember when you're doing this sort of thing, when I'm getting ready to add this fraction, that second fraction bar is just like parentheses. So if it's a negative sign in front of it, that has to be distributed. But in this case, it's a positive, so it's no big deal. I'm gonna multiply top and bottom of the separate, second fraction by V plus U. So I'm gonna say D times V plus U. And all this has a common denominator of V plus U times V minus U. And y'all probably all remember what that is from your factoring. Anybody? Remember A plus B times A minus B is A squared minus B squared. So we've got that. You can see when I multiply the the D by the first parentheses, I get DV minus DU, and then I get plus DV plus DU. So you see the DUs are gonna cancel out. So I end up getting two DV over two. So the twos are gonna cancel out and I end up just getting D over V squared, or oh, V's here as well, V squared minus U squared. That's T1. Does everybody see how I did that? Any questions on that one? Now, the second part's a little bit more problematic. So let me come over here. So we still have our stream over here. And what I'm trying to do is say, take off from here go a distance D over two, and then turn around and come back a distance D over two. But in order to actually do that, if I wanna actually stay perpendicular to the stream, then on the way up, my velocity has to be pointing this way, such that this component right here, which is V perpendicular to the string, is equal in magnitude to u, right? Because when I'm going across the stream, if I don't have that perpendicular component of velocity, then uh, it's going to drift to the left or to the right. In other words, if I'm going too fast, uh, v, v perpendicular would be bigger than u, so I'd actually make some headway to the right. But if I'm going, if my v perpendicular is smaller than u, I'll be drifting to the left. So in order for it to be exactly that way, I have to go with that component being exactly equal to U. And then this component is the only one that's, that's applied to going the distance D over two. And this component is gonna be called V parallel. 
Now on the way back, I actually have to have V like this, where again, this component V perp is equal in magnitude to U. Excuse me, I drew that backwards. Okay, and V perp has to be U, and this part is V parallel. Now, you can see from this one that uh, U squared plus V parallel squared is equal to V squared. So V parallel must equal the square root of V squared minus U squared. Does that make sense? Do you see that this gives you the same result? V parallel is equal to square root V squared minus U squared. Just from using the Pythagorean theorem. So this is all part B. So T2 is equal to D over two divided by V parallel plus D over two divided by V parallel. So we're gonna get D over two square root V squared minus U squared plus D over two square root V squared minus U squared. And of course you have a common denominator. So it's gonna become two D over two square root V squared over U squared or V squared minus U squared. So T two is in fact just equal to T D over the square root of V squared minus U squared. Does that make sense to everyone? So the only reason why we had to change this one is because we had to account for the sh like the angle that the boat will be going at. Mm -hmm. Are we assuming that the stream is going to the left? Yes, yes, we drew that in okay. the previous diagram. Uh, see right here. I think I just missed that. Yeah, that okay. you right there is, is suggesting that the stream is running from right to left. Okay. I so think I on the way, <laughs> on the way up on the paper, I've got to have my vector pointing a little bit to the right of up to counteract that U or else I'll go a crooked path and set a perpendicular to the stream. And then on the right. way back, I still got to cancel out that one by going a little to the right of down. And oh, that makes so much more sense. Okay, thank you. No problem. Good questions. So anybody have any other questions? Anybody not understand anything about that? Okay, so that's really, the only section I haven't covered in chapter three. One thing that I, uh, I find useful that you guys might not have realized is uh, there's something that sometimes you, it's so obvious we teachers don't teach it, but sometimes we look at it and realize, wait a second, it took me a long time before I realized that. So let me do something kind of quick for you that helps you. Uh, Sometimes you're giving a given a scalar formula like F is equal to G times M1 times M2 over R squared. And what R is is really a vector that points one way or the other from the center of mass of M1 to the center of mass of M2. So you could say, you know, here's a coordinate system x, y, z, and here's a mass m1 with a center of mass right there, and here's a mass m2 with a center of mass, say, right there, and we might say the vector from here to here is r, okay? So what r is is really the distance between them. Now, 
when Newton wrote this law of gravity, which is what this is, he said uh, two, any two objects with mass will experience an attractive force that is proportional to the product of the masses, that's M1 times M2, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So that's why the R down there is squared. And it acts along the line connecting the center of mass of the two objects, okay? So acts along the line and is attractive is all you need for direction. So right now when I show R and I point it from M1 to M2, that's the force on M1 due to M2. That's, that's, that's the direction of it parallel to R. So it might be helpful to find a way to actually calculate R, a vector, right? So let's say this guy had a coordinate, let's say, of uh, one meter. Uh, let's say X is in fact 10, or X is in fact negative 10 meters. And let's say Y is in fact uh, three meters. And let's say this guy over here is that X equals negative two meters. Y is going to equal 1.5 meters and Z is gonna equal 1.5 meters. So here's the part that I'm trying to get at. If I would like to write R as a vector, I can use that other vector notation I showed you guys. Remember I said use the less than symbol. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the coordinates of the head and subtract from it the coordinates of the tail. So I'm gonna say, one meter minus two meters, comma, that's the X component. Negative 10 meters minus 1.5 meters, that's the Y component. And now I'm gonna say three meters minus 1.5 meters, that's the Z component. So that's something that I haven't told you, but I sort of take it for granted, but it, sometimes I realize, you know, I didn't necessarily know that when I first started. So I want to make sure you guys knew that. And I'm going to take it at another level in a second. So what I ultimately get is negative one meter I hat, negative 10 minus negative 1.5 is minus 11.5 meters J hat and three minus 1.5, is plus 1.5 meters k hat. So that's a way you can do vectors. You just take their coordinates of the head of the vector and subtract from it the coordinates of the tail of the vector. If you do that, you will get the vector that goes from the tail to the head, okay? Now, if I were to multiply this force, this F equals G M1 M2 times uh, divided by R squared, if I multiplied that by R, I would in fact get the direction of the force on one due to two. But do you realize that the magnitude would be screw up, screwed up now? Because I'm supposed to take G, which is a constant, 6.67 times to the negative 11th, multiply it by M1, multiply it by M2, and then take that result and divide it by whatever the length of that vector is squared. So if I did that, and then I multiplied by R, I'm actually multiplying by the length of that vector as well. So I've made it basically a G M1 M2 over R by multiplying it by R. So another handy fact or another handy object is uh, the unit vector parallel to a vector. So if I wanted to make R hat, which is a unit vector parallel to R, then all I have to do is take R and divide it by the magnitude of R. Okay. So in this case, R hat would be, notice by the way, when I do the magnitude, this is a uh, three perpendicular directions. So the Pythagorean theorem not only works in two dimensions where it's a squared plus b squared, but if it's a squared plus b squared, that'll give you the x, y portion of the Pythagorean theorem. But that is in fact perpendicular to the z direction. So then you can go 
the square of that plus the square of the z gives you the square of the length. So in fact, we're gonna say negative i hat, in other words, I'm not gonna write the actual, the actual one there. And I'm not writing the meter because the meter is gonna cancel out. Minus 11.5, that again, that meter's canceling out, j hat plus 1.5 k hat is all divided by the square root of uh, one plus 11.5 squared plus 1.5 squared. So that is, in fact, what would it mean to do that? Hold on. That is, in fact, uh, the unit vector. Okay, so if I multiplied f by this unit vector, then I wouldn't mess up the magnitude of the, of the formula that I had, so the vector would have the right length, and since I multiplied it by r vector or r hat vector, then it's also got the right direction. So that's two things that come in super handy in physics on a day-to-day -day basis, especially like in uh, when you do relativity. I, I mean, when you do gravity, that's one case. When you start to do electricity and magnetism, that's another case where you've got formulas that are for vector quantities, uh, only they don't give you vector formulas for them. So. I'm going to give you that. Also, if you take like a solid state or material science type class, uh, a lot of that revolves around understanding how molecules or atoms arrange together to make a solid. They're called lattices. And some materials do what's called a cubic lattice, which would be just like you have a atom or a molecule at the, each corner of a die, you know, short for dice. Okay. Uh, there's also body-centered cubic, which is where you'd have an atom or a molecule at each corner plus one in the center. Usually the one in the center is different from the four on the outside. Or you could have a face-centered cubic, which would have the four corners and then the, four, the six faces would each have a different atom in their center. So one of the things that you're going to do when you take such a class is you're going to have to find the distance between uh, two adjacent two of those atoms in that lattice and the angle between the bonds between them. So this will all come in handy with that because you can make vectors from just imagining it in the three-dimensional coordinate system. You can take a dot product of two vectors, divide it by the magnitude of the product of the two vectors or the product of the magnitude of the two vectors, and that'll give you the actual cosine of the angle between them. So all that stuff comes in handy. And that ends chapter three. We had actually ended it last time. I just wanted to cover a couple more things. So I think what I'm going to do now is since we're past that part, let's go ahead and let you guys take a, let's take a seven minute break. It's 6.23 now. Come back at 6.30. I'm going to stay here and answer any questions you might have, but uh, take about seven minutes for a break. Uh, I haven't been giving you your break, so that's not good. Uh, I'm supposed to. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can ask them. I'm sitting right here. Were you able to go back and change my grade for the homework assignments that you said that you would? Uh, who's speaking right now? This is Courtney. Courtney, I yeah. thought what I discovered is it had fixed them itself. Uh, okay. Let me check that right now while I'm here though. Okay. So I'm gonna go back to my lab and mastering. And your grades were right on my lab and mastering, but they were wrong in the grade book on, uh, oh no, it was it was a late assignment or, or something that was grading it like it was late, right? So it was wrong in my lab and mastering as well as in our grade book? Is that, that is correct? correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's do all. Okay, what I just did just now was hopefully correcting everything. I just clicked on sync all grades instead of just chapters one. But now I'm going to go over to my lab and mastering. I'm going to check what it says over there for your grades. And I'm going to yell out those grades real loud because that would get me fired. <laughs> so, no, I'm not, not going to do that. Uh, 
Now I'm going to keep that between you and I. And I can look at my grade book and you said your name's Courtney. Rainy Rio Frio. Okay. Oh, I see it. Got you. So you had, uh, which ones were the wrong grades? Was it chapters three or chapters one and two or physics intro or primer or whatever? The first homework assignment that we had. Okay. I'm looking at that now. Let's see what's happening. I'm trying to see if it took off points for being late or something. Oh, partial credit for late work is what it's giving you. Uh, the due date was six, seven. Okay, I see what's going on. Yeah, I just had to figure out exactly why it did what it did. So I had made this do six, three, and what it's doing is it's taking some part off. Actually, no, it gave you 100% for that. Can you chat to me and only me what grade you thought that homework was supposed to have? I'm actually a little bit confused as how the grading system works on okay. that thing. So I don't know what my grade is actually supposed to be. I was just curious as to if you had updated it. Yeah, so I'm looking at it right now. It looks like uh, I thought it was taking points off for being late, but no, that's just telling, telling the generic fact that partial credit is given when you do late work uh, because I see several problems where you have full credit and it was done before the due date. So uh, each, each problem has a different value of points. I, I base the points on a particular problem as uh, related to the amount of time it takes. So for instance, if a, a problem on average takes students 15 minutes, I usually give them 15 points for that one. Whereas if another problem only takes one minute, I give them uh, one point for that one. Okay, and this is for the first homework assignment, correct? Not yeah, I'm looking one. at chapter 01 HW. And okay. it, says, it says the due date. Yeah, and it looks like it's, uh, there was one that appears to have not gotten any credit, but it wasn't due to lateness. It just was never done, that sort of thing. Yeah, this looks right to me. But if you if you find a problem with it, uh, take a snapshot of what it's showing on your side. I'm getting ready to go check, make sure it matches on the other side. Uh, I'm not saying any specifics on purpose, okay? But I'm going to check mm -hmm. and make sure it works right with our grade book over there, and then we'll be done. But like I said, if you if you find an error in the grading, let me know. Uh, but mm -hmm. right now it looks like that grading's correct. Now I'm just going to check and see if it had. Ooh. Oh, there you are. Yep, it's got the right, it's got the same grade here as it does over there. So that part's okay as well. Okay, I'll double check it as well. Okay, so yeah, pay attention to the number of points per problem. Uh, because if you if you got, you know, let's say eight out of 10 problems correct, that's not necessarily an 80. It could have been that you got eight of the one point problems and then the other two were, were worth, you know, 92 points total, in which case you got a, an eight as a score. <laughs> that would be horrible. Uh, but that's that's a possibility when the points count differently. Okay. okay. I appreciate Yeah, check, check that out. Make sure it's grading everything right. And let me tell you what the grading system is just for so you'd understand. Uh, and I'll save this for the whole class. It says number of tries per question is six. Some credit is lost for each incorrect answer. I think I took one or two percent for each time you answer it. Hence, can help you correctly answer the uh, main part question, avoiding credit loss for wrong answer attempts, and hence do not affect your score. So you can take the hints; they're not going to uh, count against you. Uh, you lose all credit for a question if you run out of answer attempts or request the answer. And then your late assignments receive partial credit, 5% reduction, uh, reduction per day. So that's it's the way that's three, created. It's 3% for every time you get the answer wrong. Is it three? That's a little yeah. bigger than I wanted. I'll see if I can change that. I don't think I can after the fact. I usually try to do one or 2% because I want to encourage you guys to answer it 
uh, or keep trying anyways. Uh, I'll see if I can change that. It might be something I'll change. Otherwise, I'll just stick to it as it is. But I think I might be able to change it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and please let me know. Uh, send me an email. Take a photograph of what's wrong, what you think grading should be or whatever, and take a screenshot of what it is so I can make sense of it. But that should be good. I will. And then I don't know if I missed this because I was a little late to class. But for the exam, are you giving us a formula sheet or are we creating our own formula sheet? You create your own formula sheet. Okay. Also, uh, since you said you were late to class, I want to reannounce to everybody just in case anybody else was late. The test is the first test and that will be Wednesday during your lab time. I'm going to give you an hour and 15 minutes to take it. But it, unlike an online test, you only have access to your scientific calculator, which cannot be on your phone or on your iPad or anything like that. Uh, you can have blank paper and you can have an equation sheet, but the equations are only the equations that are numbered in the textbook. So like when you go through chapter one, there'll be a one dash one. Uh, in parentheses next to equation. Well, that equation, since it has that one dash one in parentheses, you can use that on your equation sheet. And generally speaking, you can only use those. However, you saw in chapter three, I did a derivation of some results for a projectile. Uh, I told you all you can, you can use those on your equation sheet too. So feel free to cap, uh, copy those, but it's not gonna be relevant because this test is just on chapters one and two. Uh, sometime that day or maybe early the next morning, test uh, two will appear, and that's on chapters one, two, three, and four, but mostly three and four, and that's an online test that you're allowed to take up to three times. I only count your highest score. Uh, you have a very limited amount of time, but you're allowed to do Google searches. You're allowed to use your notes. You're allowed to use your textbook. You're just not allowed to use another person, uh, and that means you can't text them, you can't Skype them, you can't FaceTime them, you can't talk to them in person, and you can't have someone uh, create a website or a document that uh, after the test has been created and then you look at it, right? So, so that's really what I'm trying to do is just say, no one that has seen the test should be communicating with you. Any questions on that? Uh, Sarah put a chat or a message in the chat asking if we have a lecture after the test on Wednesday. Yes, we will we'll have our normal lecture just because the lecture about time is so valuable in general. So it has to be, and I have no idea what just happened with everything. Where's my Zoom at? Oh, there I am. Ooh, okay. I stopped sharing the screen, but my screen with my face on it disappeared. So I didn't know where I was. Thanks, Sarah. I see that. We'll, we will have, yeah, we, we, you will have a lecture. You'll have a good break though, because your lab normally is what, two and a half hours or something. So uh, you're only going to have to stay for an hour and 15 minutes. If you guys have an accommodation, make sure you get it to me and Mr. Mitchell well in advance. I might, if it's too long, I might, if you have an extension, I might have to send you, set you up to go take it at the testing center instead of in the lab. Uh, also, if you, if you need to, for assessment reasons, uh, I mean, for, uh, uh, for, uh, hang on, what's the phrase? Mm, for an accommodation, that's the word. All I could think was asymmetry. Where does that word come from? I don't know. <laughs> so anyways, if you have an accommodation that needs a really quiet room, sometimes the testing uh, in a classroom or a lab is not that kind of room. So I, uh, if you need to, you might want to let me know and I'll sit up in the testing center for you. Okay. All right. So now we're going to start on chapter four. Sorry, professor, but I had one question I really, really wanted to slip in there. Okay, go for it. Okay, so on Canvas, when you change the due dates, does that erase what we've already turned in there? No, it should. Uh, in fact, it's supposed to be smart enough to, if I change the due dates to a later date to even correct it. Uh, like if it taken points off for it being late, it'll now correct it and make the score correct uh, as if it wasn't late. Okay. So none of that think, should happen. Right. I don't know. When I turned in, I tried out some extra credits. I turned them in, I checked back. And it said that it, I had to start the assignment still. And I was like, that doesn't make sense if it had already been turned in unless something was changed on the actual assignment. Itself. Was it just one of the extra credits? Yeah. I mean, 
I, I don't know if my score got lost or my work got lost, but I'll check that uh, after class. Uh, okay. I shot you. I know I haven't just graded any extra credits, and I did see yours had extra credits in it. So it might just be that I haven't graded it yet. Okay. Well, that's that's just odd that it doesn't even show up that I turned it in. So gotcha. I was worried about that. <laughs> yeah, I did see your name with at least one extra credit turned in on it. So I know I at least have that. If I, if I find out that you uh, don't have something that you that you did turn in, I, I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, if you at least let me know which ones you did, so I can okay. Verify it against All right. What I have. No Do you problem. accept late extra credit? Uh, if generally speaking, I want them done by the time that uh, I put as a due date. But to be honest with you, if I haven't graded yet, I'll give you full credit. And I haven't mm -hmm. graded them yet, so any of them I put up there, if you do them, uh, you're going to get full credit as long as you get it done before I grade them. Some thoughts. Okay. And don't feel, don't apologize for asking me questions, folks. I want you to ask questions. That's a good thing. Okay. There's no, there's no dumb questions. Uh, I prefer it not to be a question that I literally just answered, but you know, sometimes you're, you're taking an online class guys. It's perfectly normal for you to phase out for about 45 seconds or maybe even several minutes. If that happens, you're going to miss something I said, and I might be a goober and say something smart off about it, but I'm just picking on you or playing with you. Okay. So please don't take offense. If you take offense, let me know. So I don't do that again. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, see my violin back there. Fancy. And a banjo case that that's some real McCoys there. Anyways, so we're starting chapter four now, which is Newton's laws of motion. So I'm going to write down a version of Newton law, Newton's laws of motion, and uh, then I'm going to tell you various ways you can word it and tell you ways that it's valuable. And then I'm going to get you started on solving some some problems of Newton's laws. But I want you to remember that whatever examples I don't get to do, you still got a ton of them on my YouTube channel. So I want you to take advantage of that. So first off, Newton, when he wrote his Principia, notice it's pronounced Principia because there's no uh, there's no S sounding C's in the Latin language. And Latin was the, the language of the intellectuals at the time. So he wrote it in Latin, even though you know nobody really spoke Latin uh, like as a country language or anything. But anyways, that's what it's written in. So it's his Principia. And he really revolutionized science. I mean, he completely... Uh, made us or gave us a complete way of solving any problems. And it was phenomenal. And he said, if I had seen further than others, it's only because I stood on the shoulders of giants. And I told you about how that was a, a dig at Robert Hook, but it was actually some humility in that by him saying, you know, hey, I, I realized that Newton's first law of motion, which he didn't have the, the chutzpah to call it that, or he didn't have the arrogance to call it that, which he was pretty arrogant, but not really. I mean, uh, compared to how awesome he was. But he didn't call it that, but it was the first law of motion. And it actually was just Galileo's law of inertia. Galileo had said, uh, basically, it's as if an object has inertia. And that inertia is a reluctance to change its motion. And because of that, Aristotle was wrong. And, and the word inertia doesn't really solve any problems or make, make it understandable. It just more or less gives you a reason to, to maybe not feel so bad about, you know, peeing on uh, Newt, I mean, on, uh, uh, on, uh, dang it, I don't forgot the guy's name, <laughs> on our founding father of science from the ancient Greeks, right? Uh, Aristotle, that's the name I'm giving you. I'm really bad with words today, and A words, really. So, yeah, it, it's really that, you know, we had put Aristotle in such high esteem, we as a, as a civilization had put Aristotle in such a high esteem. We had interpreted all our scripture in terms of the laws of science as Aristotle had taught. So when you go in and overturn something like Aristotelian thought, uh, you feel kind of obligated to make some explanation of it because it's obvious that if I roll, if I go out to the a road out here and I roll a bowling ball down the road, it's going to come to a stop. And that's what Aristotle said is supposed to happen, whereas Galileo said an object in motion tends to stay in that state of motion unless acted upon by that external force, which is really Newton's first law of motion. Uh, F equals ma, on the other hand, which is Newton's second law of motion, that really is, is Newton's uh, discovery. That's his contribution. And then Newton's third law, I actually saw, I was uh, lucky enough to be in Utah when they had a Leonardo da Vinci uh, exhibit and I got to see in his notebook and it literally said uh, 
as is obvious, if an eagle pushes down on the wind with a force of 50 pounds, then the uh, wind will push up on the eagle with a force of 50 pounds. Uh, that's Newton's third law of motion. And that's, you know, Leonardo. So anyways, these things are very much known. So let me go ahead and share my screen again. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Bada bing, bada boom. Here I am. Okay. So, first law. So an object in motion will stay in that state of motion unless act unless or until a net external force acts on it. Okay, uh, an easier way of saying that is instead of saying that object or, or that state of motion is just say an object's going to have a constant velocity. Remember velocity being a vector quantity. So this just means constant velocity. unless summation of the forces is not equal to zero. Okay, so that's another way of thinking about it. An object will maintain a constant velocity unless the net force is not zero. And notice I said net and I said external. Uh, you've probably had jobs before, so you know the horrible difference between your gross uh, income and your net income, right? <laughs> so net means add up all of them. So when I say net force, I usually uh, add this sigma that you're seeing right here because sigma is literally the symbol we use in mathematics for summation, okay? So I tend to try to write it that way so that you don't forget and you, you can't just apply, for instance, Newton's second law of motion to a particular force. You actually gotta apply it to all the forces acting. And then when I say external force, it turns out when you're using Newton's laws of motion, what you call the object is entirely up to you. So for instance, I might make a little train of boxes and that train of boxes will be a rope tied to a box and then a rope tied from that box to another box and then a rope tied from that box to another box. I could treat that whole train as a train with one string pulling on it and that would be my system. But if I do that, then I can only count the forces acting on that train. I can't count the forces that one part of the train acts on another. So I can't tell anything, for instance, about the force, the rope between this first block and the second block is applying because that's an internal force. Okay. So that's why I add the phrases net and external, as you got to know to add them all up. <coughs> forces are vector quantities, so you have to add them up vectorially and you have to only count the external ones. So uh, another way of thinking about that is Andrew Jackson was wrong. You cannot lift yourself up by your own bootstraps, right? Because that's, that's you applying a force to you and that just doesn't work. All right, and yes, you should know verbatim these laws and exactly which one's which. So it's not enough to just know the three laws. You gotta know which one's the first, which one's the second, which one's the third. Now. Newton's second law is nicely written in vectors, but there was no such thing as vectors when Newton wrote it. So we can say Newton's second law is the acceleration a body receives is directly proportional to, you see that little fish 
slash alpha looking thing, that means proportional to the total force or the net force acting on it. Okay, that's part of it. And that's that's the beginnings of science. When you're when you find two variables that should be related to one another some way or the other, the first thing you can do is mathematically determine whether they're related by thumbs up, thumbs up or thumbs up, thumbs down, as I'm showing you here. Thumbs up, thumbs up, or thumbs up, thumbs down. If, as in this case, I got A over one, so A is in the numerator, and I got the summation of the forces over one, so summation of forces in the numerator, and they're on opposite sides of the equal or the proportional symbol, then that's thumbs up, thumbs up. What that means is if I double the total force acting on a body, I double ac acceleration. If I triple the the total force, I tripled the acceleration. If I cut the, the force by one ninth, then I cut the acceleration by one ninth. He also said that the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass of the body. So all of this, we're treating the object as this is the body of mass M. And what we're seeing is A is in the numerator and M is in the denominator. So this is what we call thumbs up, thumbs down. So if the mass goes up, the acceleration goes down. That's why they let old people like me play softball as opposed to baseball. Because the softball is much, much heavier, has a larger cross-sectional area, so it's more uh, likely to catch resist, uh, get more air resistance. And, of course, it's softer, so it's uh, going to absorb a little bit more of the shock as opposed to just turning it all into acceleration. Now, the final part of it is that... Uh, Newton recognized that A would in fact be parallel to the net force, okay? So that's really what you need to make it a vector equation. And we normally write it like this, the summation of the forces is equal to an object's mass times its acceleration. And you can see since mass is a scalar, and it cannot be negative. Obviously, this tells you that the net force and the acceleration are directly parallel to each other, okay? It also tells us that the units of force is equal to the kilogram times the meter per second per second, which is defined to be one Newton equals one kilogram meter per second squared okay so the unit of mass is the kilogram the unit of the acceleration is meters per second per second which we can more succinctly write as meters per second squared but i've told you about calling it otherwise okay so we now have a, a, a unit for force and the newton is about a quarter of a pound so whenever you get a, a number of newtons divided by four and that'll roughly give you what the pound is. Uh, if you want more specific other than the ballpark, then look up what the conversion factor is. It's no, no big deal though, okay? Now we've got Newton's third law. And Newton's third law is uh, one that you all probably know. For every, anyone? For every, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction or something. Yep, that's exactly right. Which it sounds pretty straightforward, and I think you sort of get it. But remember what I just told you about that relative velocity equation? Well, that rule is really a version of Newton's second law in some sense, because what, what Newton's second law, or third law, excuse me, what Newton's third law says is the force on object A due to object B. See how I wrote that? The force on object A due to object B is equal to the negative of the force on object B due to object A. So just like Vij is equal to negative Vji, we can see that FAB is equal to the negative of FBA. What that means is I had a, a book written uh, for a course that was called Physics for artists or something like that. It's a con conceptual physics book. And they stated Newton's third law is you cannot touch without being touched. In some sense, that's right. Uh, what it's saying is, hey, if you, if you decide to, you know, hit a wall, like 
every every high school party you ever went to, somebody got mad and hit a wall, right? Uh, no matter you know what you're doing in your weight training class, no matter what you're bench pressing, no matter how many push-ups you're doing, no matter how big of a you know football star, or wrestling star you are, if you do the quote unquote calculation in your head that you're stronger than wall, therefore I can punch wall and break wall and look cool and scare my girlfriend and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, just know that whatever force it does take to break that wall, if you succeed, that force is not only going to be applied to the wall, that wall is going to apply that exact same size force to you, but in the opposite direction. Ergo, your friend comes back to school the next day with one of his finger bones broken or his knuckles smashed or something like that. Okay. Uh, another example of Newton's third law is if you've ever tried to swat a fly in the air, it's pretty hard, right? If, you, if you've ever tried to do it, it's like you, you hit them and they just sort of fall over, but then they get up and they fly off like they're not hurt. And I'm like, look, I can hit harder than, you know, most people. I, that should have hurt the fly. Well, think about it this way. This is the most superficial way to look at it. Whatever force you want to apply to the to the fly, the fly has to be able to supply an equally large force to you. Do you think a fly can really apply a great force to you? That's why. Okay. Now that's a very superficial way of looking at it. It's technically right, but it's a superficial way. You're not thinking about what what that is. Uh, what it is is from Newton's second law. We see that the total force you apply to something has to be equal to the product of its mass times its acceleration. Let's pretend for a second that I want to hit a fly. And let's percent, pretend I'm that, that kick butt pitcher for the University of Tennessee who was throwing 105 mile per hour fastball a couple of weeks ago, right? So in principle, that means my hand can move at a rate of 105 miles per hour. So if a fly happens to be right about where I would throw that ball through, then I can, in principle, take my hand and swat it at 105 miles per hour, hit the fly, and the fly will be compelled to go from its essential zero velocity to a velocity of 105 miles per hour in a matter of a tenth or a hundredth of a second, right? So the acceleration is 100 miles per hour, which is on the order of, you know, probably 80 meters per second, okay? So you're talking like 80, 90 meters per second, and you're going to divide that by 100 a second. That's like uh, 9,000 meters per second every second. That sounds huge. That's a huge acceleration. But in order for me to give that, that fly, that acceleration, the force I have to apply is just the mass of the fly times that acceleration. Well, if the acceleration is 9,000, that seems like a big deal. But what, what, what happens when I multiply the acceleration times 1 point, or excuse me, 1.0 times 10 to the negative third? Because a uh, um, fly's mass is on the order of a couple grams, right? Not kilograms, grams. And kilograms are what we're supposed to use in there. So what you see is that big 9,000 number that shows up on the right of F equals MA as all of a sudden went from 9,000 to about nine. So you, the fly doesn't require very much force to bring it up to five mile, or to, to 105 miles per hour. Ergo, it doesn't have to put much force back on you and therefore you can hit it and nothing happens. Uh, they might get a little stunned. They might get confused or stunned a little bit. Uh, they're probably, they might bounce off the wall and then stagger a couple of seconds and then fly away. Okay. So that's why it's so hard to hit a fly and actually kill it in the air. Uh, you can also see the same thing. Like if you drop a little tissue, it's really hard to hit a tissue hard, that sort of thing. It's all about Newton's third law. Now, a lot of times people will say Newton's third law is also sort of the least valuable law. And that's not really true. In, in some sense, a lot of physics problems can't be solved unless you know Newton's third law. So let's imagine this. Let's imagine that you're like a uh, human 2.0. You've actually integrated software and uh, a heads up screen into your glasses that tell you things about like about yourself. Like it tells you 
instantaneously what your mass is. It tells you instantaneously what your weight is. We're going to talk about the difference of those later. Uh, and it, the heads up display also tells me the force I apply to anything. So let's say I have such a heads up display and I'm such a human 2.0 that I have all this stuff. So I line up at the, at the, at the running blocks and I get in my three point or four point stance and I hear the gun go off and I instantly take off with all my might and it reads up a force of uh, 780 newtons. And it tells me my mass is uh, 112 kilograms. Guess what? I still cannot solve the problem of what's Mr. Younger's acceleration because Newton's second law says the summation of the forces acting on mass M gives an acceleration equal to A equals the total force divided by the mass, right? All I have is the force that I apply to the running blocks. That's not the force that's applied to me. So I can't solve that problem. But by using Newton's third law, we realize, wait a second, if Mr. Younger apply, applies a 780 Newton force to a block in the backwards direction, then according to Newton's third law, the block applies a force of 780 Newtons in the positive direction. Now I've got the forces acting on me. The air resistance is negligible. Gravity is pulling downward on me, but that's being counteracted by the what we call normal forces acting on my, the bottom of my feet by the ground. And that's usually equal to mass times G, in other words, the weight of me. So those are canceled out. So really the only appreciable force is the force the blocks apply to me. And I can now calculate what my acceleration will be by just putting uh, the total force being 780 Newtons divided by 113 kilograms. That should give me my uh, acceleration. Does that make sense? All right, so I just mentioned something called the normal force. Normal force is actually a mathematical term and it means perpendicular to a plane. When a line is perpendicular, I don't know why I did either. Uh, when a line is perpendicular to another line, that's just called perpendicular. But when a line is perpendicular to a plane, then it's called normal to a plane. And basically, uh, if you're sitting on a chair right now, and let's, let's assume your legs are kind of short so your feet don't touch the ground and uh, your arms are kind of short so they're not touching the armrest and you're paying close attention so your back's not touching the back of your chair. If that's the case, then the seat of your chair is pushing up on your bum and the back of your legs with exactly enough force to counteract the force of gravity. Well, the force of gravity, by the way, is what you experience, for instance, in free fall. And we studied that in projectile motion. Uh, when you had an object of mass M in free fall, the only force acting on it was gravity. And the force of gravity is called your weight, W, right? So this is free fall. So the summation of forces is equal to mass times acceleration gives us the only force acting on it, W, is equal to the mass. Does anybody recall what the acceleration is when something's in free fall? Negative 9.8. Yeah, 9.8 downwards or G, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume down the positive direction. I'm just going to write G there. So now we have a new formula. It's a formula for the weight, which is the same thing as the gravitational attraction that the Earth has for us, and it's measured in Newtons, whereas mass is your inertia, and it's measured in kilograms. OK, in the British system, we use the pound, which is technically a unit of force. So that would be the pound, whereas the, the mass unit in the British system is the slug, <laughs> which, as you imagine, 
uh, isn't that attractive, isn't that nice sounding. So we don't use that very often. Hence, we're using the unit of, of weight instead of the unit of mass, okay? So weight changes from place to place to place because it depends on that law of gravity I showed you. So if you dig into the earth deep enough that you're you know, a decent fraction of the radius of the earth, which is how far you are away from the center, then you can actually change your gravitational acceleration or you can change your weight. If you change a different latitude because the earth is not a perfect sphere, you're gonna change your weight as well. So weight is something that changes from one part of the planet to the other or from one planet to another. So for instance, if we went to the moon, our weight would be one sixth what it is here, but our mass would still be the same. So if I really was 113 kilograms, uh, assuming I didn't sweat appreciably or drink appreciably or uh, eat appreciably or poop appreciably or something like that, if I didn't lose any mass due to those things, then my mass would be 113 kilograms on the moon. It'd be 113 kilograms in free space, so on and so forth, okay? So let's do this. Let's imagine we have a 100.0 kilogram object and I am pushing with it, on it with a 500.0 Newton force at an angle of 30 degrees below the horizontal. Okay. Uh, it's on a frictionless surface. And I'd like to know what is the acceleration and B, what is F normal? So how do we do that? Well, what we do is we draw a free body diagram. I want another color. How do I make another color? Okay, there. So I want a free body diagram. I forgot I can do this. Okay, the body is going to be treated as a dot until we get to torque, and then we can start treating it as a, a, a physical body that has dimension. Its mass is going to be 100.0. Whoa, 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 forgot about that. Kill that. Go back to that. Now, the force is acting on this is, whoa, did I? The force is acting on this is this force right here. And this is 30 degrees, which I'll assume that's 30.0. And this is 500 Newtons. We also have another force acting on it. This one's acting in the positive direction. So I'm going to draw the component to be I'm going to draw the component oops, to be this way, upwards. And that's called my normal force. Then I have a weight acting in the negative direction. I forgot it doesn't like arrows. And that's my weight, which equals mg, or that's the object's weight, which equals mg, which is 980 newtons. And now what I have to do is break this force that's black into components parallel to each of the axes. So I have a negative uh, y component because I need to go from the tail of the vector to the head. And if I did so by going parallel to the x-axis, that would make me go down. So I'm doing that. And then I got to go in the positive x direction. So I do that. Okay. 
And this is, in fact, F sub Y, and this is F sub X. So the summation of the forces in the X direction equals mass times acceleration in the X direction. That's really what Newton's law, second law as a vector tells us. We can write it like this, or we can break it up into components and say, the summation forces in the X direction equals mass times acceleration in the X direction. And then vectors, at least along the X direction, all making positive and negative. And the summation forces in the Y direction equals mass times acceleration in the Y direction. And the summation forces in the Z direction equals mass times acceleration in the Z direction. So now if I treat the X, you see the only force acting in the X direction is F sub X, which is 500 point zero newtons times cosine 30.0 degrees and that's equal to 100.0 kilograms times the only acceleration we're going to have so i'm just going to call that a so the square root of uh or excuse me cosine 30 is root three over two root three is about 1.73. If I multiply 1.73 times five, I get about 8.5, 8.65. And then I divide that by two, uh, that becomes 8.65 Newtons over two is equal to 100.0 kilograms times A. So A is gonna be, 8.65 divided by 2 is about 4.3, uh, 4.325. Whoa, I just shifted the eraser, don't know how. So this is about 4.325 newtons divided by 100.0 kilograms. So I already know the A is 0 0.043 three meters, oops, meters per second every second. That makes sense? Now, the summation of forces in the y direction, that was part A there. So the summation of forces in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. In this case, we don't expect this block that's on the, on the ground to start jumping up and down just because we're pushing it, sliding it along the floor. In fact, we therefore expect that it's gonna be sitting there and still sitting there and still sitting there. So the velocity is not only zero, but it's staying zero. So the acceleration must be zero. What that means is now, Fn is point, pointing up, so we're, that's going to be positive. Then we got negative 500.0 newtons times the sine of 30 degrees. I don't know what I'm doing there. Oh, well, close enough. Times the sine of 30 degrees minus 980 newtons is equal to zero. So we can now see that the normal force is equal to 980 Newtons plus 250.0 Newtons, which gives us 11, uh, let's see, nine is 10,000 is a, a thousand and then 1100. So 1100 and then 80. And that'd be 1,230, so 1,230 uh, newtons is the normal force. So notice, because I had a downward component of force that I was applying to that block, that actually made the force that the ground applies to the block a little bit bigger. So that's why the normal force is not necessarily just the weight. If I would have in, instead been pulling on this with a rope up and to the left, then that component would have been vertical and it would have made the, the uh, force, the normal force a little smaller. Does that make sense?
Okay. All right, are we, our class goes to 7.50, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, just want to make sure. Ooh, I was scared. I was like, man, I'm really behind. All right, so that, that's a sort of a kindergarten version of Newton's second law. Actually, a more kindergarten version would be something like a, a bear sliding down a tree due to gravity and friction. And you'd say the friction force is, say, 200 Newtons. Why is weight's 500 Newtons? So what's his, uh, what's his acceleration? Well, what you do is say down is the positive direction just because that happened to be the one that's winning. So we'd say 500 Newtons minus 200 Newtons is equal to his mass. Let's say he's the same size as me. <laughs> Let's say 115 kilograms. So 500 minus 300 be 200. 200 is equal to 115 kilograms times A. You divide both sides by 115 and that gives you acceleration. So that's sort of the really kindergarten Newton's second law equation. But I, I think you get what I'm saying here is this is a fairly straightforward problem. Uh, shouldn't be too hard on you. All right, let's work another one now. And this one's kind of neat. Uh, I'm going to say we have a block of mass 20.0 kilograms attached to a rope which is attached to a rock, uh, block or a box, either one that's 50.0 kilograms. And that's attached to another rope that's attached to a 30.0 kilogram block. They're sitting on a frictionless surface. But there's a rope right here, tension T1 is equal to, let's say, 100.0 Newtons. I'm going to call this tension T2, and I'm going to call this tension T3. And what I want to know is, A, what is the acceleration of the system? And by the way, I'm assuming the ropes aren't getting slack or stretching so that if the front block moves one inch, all the blocks move one inch to the right. If the front block moves one inch and one second, then all the blocks move one inch in one second. So they all have the same velocity. Not only that, if the front block goes from one inch per second to two inch per second in one second, then so will the second block, so will the third block. So the accelerations are all the same. So a1 is equal to A2 is equal to A3, which equals A sub X, which I'm going to call just plain A. Okay. Part B, I'd like to know what T2 is. And part C, I'd like to know what T3 is. Now, some of you might immediately jump to treating this whole object as one thing. In other words, taking this whole train as one big object. You could do that, but then you wouldn't be able to figure out the individual tensions because they would be internal forces. So if you pretended this was one big block that had a mass of uh, 20 plus 50 plus 30, that's 100 kilograms, right? You'd say you'd have 100 Newton force acting on 100 kilogram mass and you get the accelerations equal to 1.0 meters per second every second, right? Well, again, that's right. And that is actually the ultimate answer as we'll see. But what I suggest you do is not treat that. As you get better and better with physics, you can start to do stuff like that. But right now, you sort of want to think of each object as having its own uh, little F equals MA and its own little free body diagram. So first off, I'm going to draw uh, for block one. I'm going to call this M1, this one M2, and this one M3. So let's take the free body diagram M1. In your statics or dynamics, they, they sometimes have free body diagrams, but they also have like an acceleration diagram. Uh, we don't use those in physics, but we do use a free body diagram. And sometimes I'll write the acceleration somewhere on it to let you know. Uh, so again, we're going to take a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. Like so. I'm going to draw mass M1 right there, and that's M1 equals 30.0 kilograms. Now, according to this, 
it has a force, which I'm going to say is in the positive direction. And that force has a magnitude of 100.0 newtons acting on it. But then I'm going to say I have another force, let's say, acting in the, dang it, why does it keep changing back? In the negative direction. And that's going to be the tension T2. Now, notice that's weird. Okay, I said the tension T2 was pulling to the right. Well, according to mass two, tension two is pulling to the right. It says, hey, I've got this rope in front of me and it's pulling me to go straight ahead, which is the dude that's looking at me is right, right? Well, according to M1, M1 has this rope in front of M that's pulling on him with 100 Newton force but it's got this rope on its backside that's slowing it down. So it's acting as a force is acting to the left. And that's very typical of tensions. You're going to have them cancel out each other when you're comparing what it's doing to one object versus the other. Now, anybody think of two other forces that might be in action here? What about gravity and normal force? Exactly. Okay. So... First off, I'm going to make sure this is labeled X and this one up here is labeled Y. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say there's a normal force which acts this way. And then there is a weight that acts that way. And I'm not drawing anything really to scale here. This is weight equals M1G. And this one is F normal. OK, you can see the summation of forces in the y direction, making the same argument as it did before. M1 is not going to be bouncing up and down on the plane. So the summation of forces in the y direction just gives us Fn minus M1g equals zero. So that just tells us the normal force is actually equal to the weight M1g. So again, I'm not going to mess with that on these. I just got to show it there every time. So we'll remember to count those forces. Now the summation of the forces in the X direction equals mass times acceleration in the X direction. We've already decided that there's only gonna be one acceleration, so I just called that A. Well, what that's gonna give me is the uh, force of 100 Newtons minus T2 is equal to 30.0 kilograms times A, and I'm going to call this equation one. Now I'm going to do M2 free body diagram. And this time I'm going to choose black coordinate system. Plus that was an accident that I did last time. So I'm going to say the coordinate system is that and that. And now I'm going to say, uh, this is my y-axis. And this is my x-axis. And my forces acting are going to be blue in the positive direction. So I'm going to say I got this force right here. And I've got uh, this force right here. And then I've got this force right here and this force right oh, stop that here and now i'm going to say this is m2g this is in fact t3 and this is in fact t2 and this is fn two. That one should have technically been Fn1. Okay. So the summation forces in the x direction equals mass times acceleration for this case gives me T2 minus T3 is equal to 
50.0 kilograms times A, I'm going to call that equation two. Okay. Now I'm going to say M3 free body diagram. Draw my coordinate system again. I'm going to draw it here, say. And that's my x axis or y axis, and that's my x axis. Oh, I had a mass there too. This was M2 equals 50.0 kilograms. This one's M3 equals 20.0 kilograms. Okay, now the forces acting on it are again a normal force which acts upward. I hate that it just wants to do that every time. And I've got a tension uh, T3 that's pulling it forward, which I'm going to write like that. I've also got a weight pulling down. And I've got, that's it. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do is put my arrowheads on that and say that's M3G. I am going to put my arrowhead on this and say that is T3, which we don't know. And I'm gonna put my arrowhead on this and call that Fn3. Okay. So the summation forces in the X direction equals mass times acceleration, again, in the X direction, but uh, we don't have to show that because that's the only acceleration we're dealing with. Whoa. That gives me, in this case, it's going to be T3. That's the only force, uh, is equal to 20.0 kilograms times A, and that's going to be equation three. OK. So it's a good thing to number your equations. Reason being is right now we've got three unknowns, T2 we don't know, T3 we don't know, and A we don't know, and we've got exactly three equations. So if I somehow solve for one of those without using all three equations, I'll know I've done something wrong. By numbering them and then saying what I'm doing with each of the equations, I can tell whether or not I've used all the equations. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take three and plug it into two. So three into two. And when I get that, that's going to become uh, T2 minus 20.0 kilograms times A is equal to 50.0 kilograms times A, or T2 is equal to, if I pull that over to the other side, it becomes, if I pull that negative 20 kilograms A to the right-hand side, that becomes 70.0 kilograms times A. And this I'm going to call, let's say, four. So now I plug four into one, and I see that I've got 100.0 newtons minus 70.0 kilograms times A is equal to 30 times A. I'm going to leave off the unit here. Whoa. I'm going to leave off the unit here just so I can fit it in. Now you can see that 100 newtons is equal to, notice that 30 kilogram, when I pull the negative 70 kilogram A to the right-hand side, they're going to add and give me 100.0 kilograms times A. So A, as was advertised, was 1.00 meters per second every second, which is part A. Now that we have that, we can take equation, uh, let's say equation four. Now becomes T2 is equal to 70.0 kilograms 
times 1.00 meters per second every second. So we get T2 is just going to be 70.0 newtons. So that's part B. And then finally, plug this into equation three. And we get T3 is equal to uh, 20.0 kilograms times 1.00 meters per second every second, which says T3 is equal to 20.0 Newtons. So that's it, we've now done the entire problem. I should draw arrows back here to let them know what we did. Zoink, we went up to here. <laughs> so uh, some things to learn about this is notice we could have treated 20 kilograms plus 50 kilograms, which is 70 plus 30 kilograms, which is 100. We could have treated that whole object as one 100 kilogram object. We just say uh, 100 newtons is the only force acting on it. It's to the right, which is the positive direction. So we'd say 100 newtons is equal to 100 kilograms times A, and we would immediately got an A. But with treating that whole train there as if it were one object, that prevented us from finding the internal forces of you know uh, T2 pulling on the rope that causes, or excuse me, pulling on M2, or T3 pulling on M3. But by doing it this way, we can determine that the tension is notice T1 has to be the largest because that tension is actually pulling M1, M2, and, all, and M3 all up to one meter per second. Whereas T2 only has to pull 70 kilograms up to one meters per second and uh, per second every second. And then T3 only has to pull 20 kilograms. So that ends up becoming the smallest of the forces. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? All right, so let me, and I will be uploading this uh, to my Google Docs soon. So it, in fact, that happens pretty quick now that I'm using this system. Uh, let me solve another very typical problem. It's called the Atwood machine. I'm going to solve it completely in symbols. The Atwood machine can get various, uh, be various levels of complexity. But generally speaking, there's a pulley. Right now, we're going to pretend that pulley weighs so small and has such negligible friction that it's not going to even be a part of the system necessarily, OK? But what I'm going to imagine is that on this side of the pulley, there is a mass, little m, and then on, or excuse me, big M. And then on this side of the pulley, there's a mass, big M. So actually, I'll call this one big M. And I'll call this one little m. And what I want to find out is what is the acceleration? And the same arguments we used earlier tells us that the acceleration of big M is the same as the acceleration of little m. And what is the tension in the rope? So here's the issue. If this pulley had mass, we've got it drawn right now where it looks like the big M, since it's a big M, might actually be heavier. And since it would be heavier, you'd expect big M to go down, which is going to cause little m, which is lighter, to go up. Now, if the pulley actually had some mass and some friction, then the tension on the left-hand side would have to be larger than the tension on the right-hand side, because the tension on the right-hand side's only got to miss, uh, lift up little m to acceleration A, whereas uh, tension on the left-hand side has to lift M to acceleration A, but it's also got to rotate a massive pulley with friction. So TL would be greater than T right. But since this is massless, we only need one tension T. Does that make sense? Now, in addition to that, we can see if the mass on the left goes down one inch and we assume the string doesn't get slack and the string doesn't stretch, then the pulley on the right, or excuse me, the mass on the right is going to lift up one inch. 
So M, big M going down is sort of the same thing as little m going up, uh, and they go the same distance. Now, if they did that in one second, that means they both have the same speed. If they went from one inch per second to two inches per second in one second, then the big M going from one inch per second to two inches per second is going to force the little M to go from one inch per second to two inch per second, and it's going to do it in one second. So the accelerations are the same. So that's why I'm not subscripting the accelerations. Does everybody understand the arguments that I just made? Okay. Now, I'm going to draw a free body diagram for big M. And it's going to be actually quite simple. You only have to do one dimension. I'm going to say that's big M. And since I've got the problem set up to look like it's actually going down, I'm going to call down the positive x direction on this left hand side. OK. So I'm now going to take and draw the forces acting on it, one of which is not that crap. That force is what I'm calling positive now, and that's mg. And for some reason, I went to blue being negative now. And that force is t. So I get summation of the forces equals mass times acceleration is all one dimension now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say mg minus t. And since I'm only doing one body, there's no ambiguity about what mass I use. It's got to be m times a. That's going to be equation one. Now I'm going to tell you a rule that technically is not something you have to do, but if you don't do it, your life is going to be really a lot messier than it needs to be. Okay. What I do when I'm doing these types of problems is I choose a direction that I want to be the positive direction. And then I find all the other motions that are consistent with that and make them positive. So on the left-hand side, I considered the big M going downward, the positive direction, because that's what I thought was going to happen. But when the, when the big M goes down, the little M goes up. So I'm going to have to, just to keep the rule, I'm going to choose the positive X direction to be up on the right-hand side. You wouldn't necessarily get the problem wrong if you didn't do that, but you'd have to realize that A left is equal to the negative of A right, and, and just and things get ugly. So what I'm going to do again now is I'm going to draw a coordinate system for the little mass m. So there's the mass m. And this is the positive x direction now. And we seem to be sticking with red being positive. So I'm going to say that's one force. And blue being negative, I'm going to say that's another force. And this force is m1g. And this force, whoa. Is the tension. So for this equation, I get M1G minus T, or excuse me, T minus M1G. Oops, let's erase all that. So T minus M1G is just equal to M1A. So again, notice the doing a free body diagram for low, little mass M means that there's no uh, ambiguity of what mass you use. So this will be equation two. Now, most people, when they finished pre-calculus and gotten into calculus, it's been a long time by then since you've done any systems of equations and you learned a few tricks. Well, this one begs for one trick that you've probably forgotten. Anybody have a real quick and easy idea of how to solve these two equations? Where's the 
What's that? Would you use matrices or would that just overcomplicate it? You could, uh, you actually could. And, and right now you don't want to use it. You're right. That would make it more trouble than it's worth. But when we get like into circuits where we'll have two, three, four uh, currents that we have to solve for, yeah, you matrices are your friend. Right now, there's something glaring that's staring out at me. And the fact is that T in equation two is positive and T in equation one is negative. So I'm going to add uh, equation two and equation one. That's, that's the easiest trick here. And that's something I want you to keep in mind because virtually every time you solve an Atwood machine, that's going to be the, the way to do it. So you'll see that when I add these two, I'm going to get T minus M G. And then I'm going to say plus big M G minus T. That's the two left hand sides equal each other. I mean, adding together. The two right hand sides will be big M A plus little M A. I might as well factor out the A. So I'm going to say big M plus little M times A. And again, I don't know why. I keep writing a subscript one here, but oh, wow, that was not helpful. There, I fixed it. Okay. You can see now that this T cancels out with that T, and I get just plain M plus M times G is equal to, oh, excuse me, that's M minus M. Okay, oh, wait, one more. M minus M times G is equal to M plus M times A. So A is actually equal to, and this is a very common way we do things in physics, is we like to write them as a dimensionless quantity in front of something that has a very, very common unit that we're used to dealing with. So M minus M over M plus M times g is exactly that way. So we know the acceleration is the difference of the masses divided by the sum of the masses. That's a unitless quantity, but you're multiplying it by g, which is a well-known quantity and has uh, units of acceleration, so you know the units work out. Now what we can do is we can put, uh, let's put a into equation one. So I'm going to say T minus M G is equal to M times M minus M over M plus M times G. So this tells you I can get a common denominator if I pull the M G over there by multiplying by M plus M over M plus M. So I'm gonna say M times M plus M over M plus M. And then I have to add plus, cause when the MG came over there, it came positive. Now I'm adding this, which was already there. This is gonna be M times M minus M over M plus M. And all that's gonna be multiplied by G. So you can see what happens. I get a M M plus M squared plus M M minus M squared. So you can see the two M squareds cancel out and I end up getting two M M G over M plus M is equal to the tension. Now uh, the Atwood machine is gonna come up over and over and over again. And in fact, we'll do an Atwood machine where one of the masses is on an inclined plane. We'll do an Atwood machine where both of the masses are on two inclined planes of different angles. We'll do an inclined plane where both of the masses on, are on two different angles, uh, inclined planes, and have two different frictional values. Then we'll even add uh, the problem of letting the Atwood machine have a massive pulley so that you can and tell you its shape so that you can use integrals to calculate its moment of inertia. And we can even put friction on it. So over and over again, it's going to be this thing where you're going to have a tension minus tension and all this sort of stuff. So I wanted you to have that trick under your sleeve. Now, there's one more trick I want you to have under your sleeve before you leave. 
and that's solving a fuzzy dice problem. Does anybody have any questions with this before we go on? Okay. So the fuzzy or something. What's that now? I said, so if an Atwood machine question is coming up on a test or something, do we have to derive this formula or can we basically say that we know that the formula for tension is going to be this? I would say, uh, I don't think your textbook numbers these equations. If they don't, then you shouldn't have it on your equation sheet, but it, would, okay. it wouldn't hurt you to, remind, uh, to memorize them because what yeah. I've discovered is there's a bunch of different types of problems that come up with the same coefficients m minus m over m plus m and 2m over mm -hmm. m plus m so so and how so if one of these uh, masses was on an inclined plane like how would that change this problem so what you'd end up doing is you'd have a free body diagram for say the little m okay that would be an inclined plane and you'd probably set your axis, your x-axis to uh, being parallel to that plane. And then you'd have to break your weight up into components parallel and perpendicular to the plane. And you'd get, in fact, the normal force being quite different from mg. It's going to be mg cosine theta and okay. the that kind of stuff. So right. you'll see. OK, so, good questions. Thank you. No problem. All right, so let's do a fuzzy dice problem. So imagine your windshield's right here. And you got your rear view mirror right here. And someone hangs a fuzzy die right there. Now, all of a sudden, the, well, let's not do that. That's a crappy line. Now, all of a sudden, the windshield and the rear view mirror, well, don't want to do that, are like that. But the rope, is now back at an angle theta. It has a mass M, let's say it's a length L. And I know that the car has an acceleration A. So assume we know L, theta, and A. I'm sorry, can you explain what the situation is again? Because I couldn't hear you for a minute there. Okay, so we have a car windshield. That's the diagonal line. And then mm -hmm. this is a rear view mirror, the line coming off of it with a little beer beside it. And oh, okay. basically you have like a pendulum hanging from the mirror, but it's, you know, fuzzy dice or maybe a baby Yoda or maybe a plastic okay. chihuahua or whatever. <laughs> All right, right, gotcha, thank you. No problem. Uh, and actually we're, we don't know A, what we want to know is A. So I'm going to get rid of that. So what we know is L, M, and theta. And what we want to know is A, no, actually, sorry about that. I, I wanted to reword this. What I want to know is theta. So I'm going to say, assume I know M, L, and A. Okay. What is theta? In other words, we could calibrate this and make an accelerometer out of it. So I'm going to draw a free body diagram. And my free body diagram is going to be like this. Now I have a mass M right there. I have acting on it a tension in the rope, which goes like this. And of course, this angle right here being theta means this angle right here is also theta. Okay. In other words, the vertical di dash line is parallel to the vertical solid line. So that's like two railroad tracks. You just throw a piece of rebar across. And alternate interior angles are, of course, equal if the uh, railroad tracks are parallel. Now, we also have some forces acting on it. We've got a acceleration due to gravity acting in the negative direction. I'm going to call red the negative direction this time. And I will see that this is just plain mg pointing downward. Now, 
the deal is, and this is the advantage that uh, dynamics and statics uh, diagrams our classes have, is they'll make a second diagram for the acceleration. I'm just going to write up here at the top that this whole thing is accelerating at A. Okay. So when this tension and this mg add to each other, the results better cancel out except for enough of a horizontal component to create uh, an acceleration A of M. So in other words, the mass M has to accelerate at a rate M. So with that in mind, I'm gonna use, let's use green this time because green means go. I'm gonna use that to represent my uh, positive components. Whoa, no, that. So this component right here is positive. This component right here is also positive. Never mind the fact that they're missing what they're the angle they're supposed to be at. We'll just pretend like that didn't happen at all. And we can see this one is t cosine theta, and this one is t sine theta, okay? That one's equal to t vertical, and this one's equal to t horizontal, okay? So the summation of the forces in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. Uh, once this thing gets up, uh, once you hit the accelerator and it starts accelerating at, say, three meters per second every second, and it continues accelerating at that rate, then this ball will be in equilibrium and it will no longer accelerate in the upward direction. Okay, it did at first because obviously it had to swing, but now it isn't. So the result is that T sine theta, uh, or excuse me, result is that T cosine theta is acting upwards minus M1G is equal to zero. So I'm gonna say T cosine theta is equal to M, I don't know why I said one again, but MG. So this is gonna be equation one. Now I'm gonna take the summation forces in the X direction is equal to mass times the acceleration of the car, which is really the only acceleration. So in that case, I'm gonna say T sine theta is equal to MA, and that's gonna be equation two. Now, unlike that last one, you might've, when I told you the trick of solving that, those two equations was to add them, you might've actually remembered that from your math class. Sometimes you'd take one equation and multiply it by negative two, and you'd take another equation and multiply it by positive three, and then that would make the coefficients of the uh, one particular variable equal but opposite, and then you'd add them together. Well, this is one that almost no math classes show, because, and there's a very good reason for it. Uh, generally, division is dangerous because division introduces the idea of having a zero in the denominator, which is a problem. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say divide equation two by one. And what you'll see is you get T sine theta over t cosine theta is equal to m a over m g, which is neat because uh, the m's cancel out and the t's cancel out, and you get tangent theta is just equal to a over g, or you get, we want to know theta, theta is equal to the tangent inverse of A over G. Now, the reason your math teacher don't show it to you is because there is some possibility that the thing you divide in the bottom might have some particular time in which it's zero, but this is a physical problem. Any time in which T cosine theta is zero is not of any physical interest to us, so we don't have to worry about it. We do need to keep it in the back of our mind in case we later consider a case, but this one's not gonna be an issue. So there's another neat algebra trick that you should be prepared to do sometimes. Uh, sometimes you just need to divide one equation by the other to get rid of a bunch of stuff. 
Of course, you can now solve for the tension if you wanted to. You see that the result is independent of M. So if you hung a, a styrofoam ball from it or a lead ball from it, it wouldn't matter. The result would still be the same. You could actually uh, use this to calibrate your fuzzy dice and, you know, for a particular angle, find exactly what the acceleration of your car is and uh, that kind of stuff. But that's it. We're actually done with essentially all of chapter four. I haven't touched an inclined plane yet, but we're going to do so many inclined planes later that it's not that big a deal. So I think you've got enough to figure out with the examples that I have on my YouTube channel, as well as the examples in chapter four, you've got enough to understand uh, four pretty well. So uh, your homeworks for this week are chapters four and five. Remember, we're going to have chapter one and two test happens on Wednesday during lab. Uh, you'll need, you might want blank paper and you might want to make your own equation sheet. I've told you that you're only allowed equations from the textbook that are labeled with a, a parenthesis one dash two or one dash three A or something like that. If the equation is not numbered like that in your textbook, then it's not one that can be on your equation sheet. Uh, you are allowed to have a scientific or even graphing calculator. You can't use your phone or your iPad for that. Uh, if you have a laptop or a even a, a tablet or an iPad or something that can access uh, TCC's website, or and can access uh, and use Canvas and Canvas practice tests, then by all means bring it because you're going to be in a lab and the lab has 12 computers. And if y'all outnumber the computers, then you'll need a computer there. But I suspect if not, it's not a big deal. He, he can break up half of you in one class and half of you in the other. And you'll, uh, or at least 12 of you in one class and some more of you in the other. Uh, so there's not a big deal if you don't have a computer or if you have a computer that you haven't connected to the TCC internet, or you have a computer that doesn't necessarily run Canvas practice tests well, then don't worry about bringing it. Anybody have any questions on this problem before I let you guys go? All right, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll tell you guys, you are all free to go. Uh, <laughs> gotcha, Nora. Uh, you guys are free to go. I will wait for the last person to leave, though, so that I can uh, let them know. Oh, good, it's still recording. I thought for a second there I'd, I'd stopped recording and never started it back up. It scared me. Have a good time, and I will see you Wednesday night after your test. Good luck, everybody. Remember, the test three is going to come up about the same time, and it'll be due Tuesday for a week from uh, next Tuesday at 11 to 9 p.m. Thanks for coming, everybody. Sarah, Dora, anybody have any questions? Oh, hey, Kaizmo. Oh, yeah, no, I, I'm trying to find the tab where the Zoom is on right now. I have so many open right now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> it, uh... It's somewhere. <laughs> oh, got it. Okay, thank you. Have See a good one. Bye-bye. Bye.